Welcome everybody to Grand Rounds for today. I want to review the housekeeping notes. The CME code is on your screen. Uh, Dr. Stefan Heckers is the CME activity director. He has no financial relationships related to the content of this activity to disclose. Um, Dr. Blair Simpson is our presenter today. She has no financial relationships related to the content of this activity to disclose. Psychiatry Grand Rounds receives no commercial support. This talk may mention off-label or investigational use of drugs. Um, as a courtesy to our speakers, this is a Zoom webinar, which means your Zoom microphone is muted and your video is disabled. We can take questions at the end. Um, and Dr. Simpson, let me know if you'd prefer, I will monitor the Q&A along the way. Let me know if you'd prefer to be interrupted. Um, otherwise, we'll just work through the Q&A at the end. And uh, one, of, one of us will unmute you at that time to ask questions or I will ask those for you. Okay, so moving on, I am incredibly excited today to um, have Dr. Simpson be here for our Grand Rounds. We were very much looking forward to having her in person. Um, she's been to Nashville before and really enjoys it, um, but we are grateful that she agreed to um, come do a virtual visit with us and she'll be with us for the rest of the day. Um, Dr. Simpson has many titles. I'll just first say she's an international expert in anxiety disorders and OCD. Um, and really has done all of the things. So she's actively doing clinical trials, but she's also collaborating with cognitive neuroscientists, basic scientists, and really trying to approach um, anxiety and what's happening in the pathophysiology from all of the different domains, which I, I think is um, a really admirable approach and the kind of approach that we need. Um, she has many, many titles. She's professor of psychiatry at Columbia. Um, she's the vice chair for research in that department. Um, at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. She's also the Director of Psychiatric Research um, at the Center for OCD and Related Disorders. She is the co-director of the research program for Youth Anxiety Center at New York Prez. Um, she graduated from Yale with a BS in biology and I just learned studied songbirds um, in her MD PhD, but then pretty quickly um, ended up in anxiety um, she had done an MD PhD at Cornell and then moved to New York and Columbia. And she trained with one of the leaders of the field, like, uh, Dr. Michael Leibowitz, and has been at Columbia ever since and has really risen and, and now owns the whole helm of anxiety um, across all of those institutions. Um, and so I think what you'll get today is a talk that gives you really clinical information and research information and, and cutting edge um, updates on what's happening with OCD, which um, is, a, is a prevalent disorder, but we also see it in other disorders. So if you love schizophrenia, there's OCD and schizophrenia as well, and kids with other anxiety disorders. So I hope that everybody um, has a piece that they can take away from today's presentation. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Simpson. Welcome. Uh, welcome so much. Thank you, Dr. Blackford, for that really generous introduction. And I wished I could see who my audience was, but thank you very much for um, coming. Uh, so as, um, as Dr. Blackford said, is I'm a physician scientist. I'm an MD, PhD, and really my goal is to transform treatments for patients with severe mental illness. And how I do it is by conducting patient-oriented translational research to study first how to improve current treatments and second, how to reveal the brain mechanisms underlying mental illness with the goal of developing new treatment targets. So my focus has been on anxiety disorders, as Dr. Blackford said, which you know, up to a third of Americans will have an anxiety disorder in their lifetime as a group of disorders. It's among our most common, but my particular focus has been on OCD and I'll tell you about more about that today. So my talk today, I'm gonna to start by reviewing what we've learned about how to treat OCD from a series of clinical trials that I've done in collaboration with Edna Foa at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and then I'm gonna highlight two clinical challenges um, that I see we face in the field and how my research program is currently addressing each. And my, tent, my intent is to demonstrate different ways that you can translate science into better treatments for severe mental illness like OCD and to illustrate both some of the challenges and some of the progress that we can make. And I give this talk in the context of realizing there's a whole world going on and there's COVID going on and there's an election going on. Um, 
but that isn't what I'm going to talk about today. But I do know that our patients are still out there and need us and are suffering, and they're in that same world too. And so I'm hoping my talk, for those of you who do see patients with OCD and anxiety, that there's something in this talk that you can take home to make their lives a little better. So um, what do I mean by patient-oriented translation research? It's a big term. People mean a lot of different things. Here's what I mean, which is from my point of view, it's you're taking, you're translating discoveries from basic science um, and trying to test those out, what, how, that, how those findings in basic science, do they translate to human populations, including clinical populations? You're using tools like brain imaging and genetics to look at mechanisms or identify targets for intervention. You're doing clinical trials, testing new treatments, uh, testing how to improve old treatments, testing how to sequence treatments. And importantly, you're also translating from this knowledge to how to implement and disseminate treatment in the community. And all of it, right, is to pave the way to early intervention and cure. So to me, translational research, clinical translational research encompasses all of this. And I've done different, I've had the privilege to do different parts of this in my career. Um, today, I'm going to start here and tell you how my work here then led to a project that led me down here and a different project that's led me up, up here. Uh, to do this type of work, you do it in teams, big teams. And I'm so fortunate to have wonderful collaborators, both in my department at Columbia Psychiatry, a major collaborator that you're gonna hear a lot about that research today is with the Center for the Treatment and Study of Anxiety. The lead there is Dr. Edna Foa, who's an international expert in PTSD and OCD. And I've worked with many of her faculty along the way who are now leaders um, in at other institutions, um, other places. And I also have collaborations with people at other universities. And I just wanna point out in particular, the global consortium that you're gonna hear about more, which is with um, OCD experts around the world. And I'll tell you more about that. You also need money to do this type of research because patient uh, research is expensive because uh, you need to recruit the patients and the methodologies that we use require really skilled, uh, clinical teams um, to, let's say, if you're doing a clinical trial to deliver the treatment, or if you're doing brain imaging studies to pay for the brain imaging. And here are my financial disclosures. And most of my funding has come from NIMH, um, the New York State Office of Mental Health, and philanthropy and private foundations with a little bit of funding along the way from industry. Okay, so here's the outline of my talk. I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to OCD that I'm going to tell you in brief about some of the clinical trials that I've done, again, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Edna Foa that have compared medications and psychotherapy for OCD. I won't have time to really tell you much about the novel treatment strategies we've tested. Instead, I'm going to highlight this new initiative that um, we've initiated with New York State called Impact OCD. Then I'm gonna to turn to what I consider to be my studies, which are sort of for the patients of tomorrow, where I conduct neurobiological studies in collaboration with imaging experts and sometimes basic scientists, and how that work has led to the global initiative I'm gonna tell you about, whose goal is to identify reproducible biosignatures of OCD. And my program, I'm always looking for ways to bring these two pathways of my program together because it's at that intersection that I find it most exciting to work and it's that intersection that I believe is critical if we're going to bring discoveries from science into the clinic to really make lives better for our patients. So what is OCD? Uh, well, it's pretty simple, right? It's in the name, obsessions and compulsions. And what are obsessions? Repetitive thoughts, images, or urges. They're intrusive, distressing or compulsions, repetitive behaviors, or mental acts. Um, again, the symptoms must be distressing, time-consuming, more than an hour a day, and impairing to get a uh, diagnosis of a disorder. Well, those are the core features. They're also associated features, so not every OCD person looks identical, identical to each other. There's a range of content and fears of the obsession and compulsions. These have been called symptom dimensions, and they cover sort of different content areas. Uh, OCD patients can have different affects that range from anxiety and panic to not just right sensations or disgust. They can have varying insight and various comorbidities. And the point is it's got a, the, the, the disorder's got a very stereotypical core features. 
but with some heterogeneity. And that can both complicate diagnosis and treatment, but it also raises interesting questions about the relationship between how the brain produces these different clinical profiles. And I'll return to that near the end of my talk. I love to really emphasize this. This sometimes surprises people who don't work in OCD. So the lifetime prevalence of OCD is about 2%, whereas the lifetime prevalence of schizophrenia is 1%. So OCD is twice as common as schizophrenia. The median age of onset is 19, whereas the median age of onset of major depression is 32, and a quarter of the cases start by age 14. Um, when you get OCD, um, the typical course is chronic waxing and waning symptoms. Um, and if you look at the, the proportion of, when you look at cases and you look epidemiological at what proportion are mild, moderate, or severe, unlike many of the anxiety disorders, OCD has a very high proportion of moderate to severe cases. So if you add that all up, it's not the most common anxiety disorder, but it's more common than schizophrenia. Um, it occurs early in life. And when you get it, you keep your symptoms. And if you get it, you're likely to have moderate to severe symptoms. That's why it's a disabling disorder. Now, we've known for a while that there are two treatments, first line treatments that work. One is uh, medication. It's a class of medications that have been found effective in OCD and randomized controlled trials, both industry sponsored and others. Um, these are uh, medication treatment with serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which include clomipramine, which is a, a tricyclic antidepressant, as well as the selective um, SRIs, which I've listed here. And we have studies that show that they all work. So um, that's not a, a question. The other main treatment that we have um, that we know also works for OCD is cognitive behavioral therapy, but of a very particular type. And it's been called lots of things, but it's exposure and response or ritual prevention. It's got lots of different acronyms, acronyms that have been used in the literature. So what is it? Just so we're all on the same page. Um, so again, it's sort of a simple treatment in some ways, right? It's in the name, exposure and ritual prevention. So what you do is you make a hierarchy of what an OCD person might be scared of um, that triggers their obsessions or compulsions. And you, in a prolonged, very structured way, expose them to those stimuli up a hierarchy till you get to the top of their fear. And in parallel, you're coaching them how not to avoid and also how not to do their rituals. Um, I'm gonna give you an example just to sort of make it real. So for example, I worked with a patient, an OCD patient who had concerns about harming others. Um, and um, in particular, one of his issues was um, he kept worrying when he drove to work that he, when he drove through an intersection that he had run someone over. And so he was often an hour or more late for work because he'd go through an intersection. He then doubt whether or worry that he had actually killed someone and he'd go back around the block to make sure that he actually hadn't, there wasn't an accident in the intersection. And at night he would listen to the police radio listening for accidents on his route home to try to reassure himself that he really actually hadn't killed anyone. So there's an example of one type of his symptoms around harm. So for example, um, what would we do with him? Uh, we would do imaginal exposures where he actually did run someone over. You obviously wouldn't have him do that in real life, but that would be an imaginal exposure. And you would get him to spell out, well, what's, what's like, I mean, literally, like what's so bad about that? Like, let's say you did run some one over, what does that really mean? And you would get a very personal story about what that would mean to that person. So for example, that would mean I'm a sinner and I'm gonna go to hell forever. Or that would mean I will lose my marriage and every all my friends will hate me. Or that will mean I'll be in prison for the rest of my life and not see my grandchildren grow up. I mean, it's that's what I'm trying to give you the details. It could be different feared consequences, but you would, make that story include those feared consequences of happening. And you would do that as an imaginal exposure. And then as an in vivo exposure, for example, you'd go driving with him and you would not, you know, you would not let him go back around the intersection. Um, and you can, there are ways that you would sort of enhance that exposure. Um, so what's the goal of this treatment? You know, it's, multiple goals, but one is to disconfirm the fears that people have and challenge distorted beliefs. There's also breaking the habit many of these people have gotten into about ritualizing and avoiding, but obviously fundamentally, 
the real goal is to improve their functioning and quality of life. And we know that with minimal OCD symptoms, you can do that. There are many different formats that have been used. The standard format that um, we've been using has been two planning sessions plus 15 exposure sessions um, as a sort of a standard acute course. The key to this treatment is daily homework where you ask the patient to practice exposures and ritual prevention in between sessions. And you do home visits to promote generalization of what they're learning to their home environment. And that's really fascinating. You know, I was trained as a psychiatrist in a dynamic program at that time. And the thought that you would actually go to someone's house or go drive in their car or meet their family in this sort of out in the real world was sort of like a taboo thing. But in fact, it's a fascinating thing to walk into this person's um, world of OCD and then try to be that figure who teaches them how to do it differently. Um, I do think that Freud would see it as um, the internalization of the therapist. And I've had patients say to me, well, you know, Dr. Simpson, I was going to go washing, but I called you up and when you were stood in my living room and told me how to do it and it helped me to say no. So, I, you know, it's an interesting process. Okay. So I'm going to take you back to like the 1980s. We knew um, medications worked for OCD. We knew that this very particular um, kind of behavioral therapy worked for OCD. But the question is, is which was better? And maybe was it better to put them together? And this was a, um, this was a study that was started uh, by my research mentor, Dr. Michael Leibowitz, um, who partner, who was a leading psychopharmacologist on the medication side. And he partnered with Dr. Edna Foe at the University of Pennsylvania, you know, a leading person in the CBT field of OCD. And they decided to join forces and to basically do the first really well-designed horse race to address this question. And to address this question, this is a classic clinical, uh, clinical trial, our gold standard to sort of figure out, you know, whether a treatment works or not. So they recruited uh, OCD adults with OCD who did not have significant depression. And that was done very on purpose because the goal was what's the best treatment for OCD, not OCD with comorbid depression, right? So, so there was a debate in the literature at the time is does medication really work for OCD or is it really only working because it treats the depression, if you understand what I'm saying. So again, recruiting adults with OCD, um, of moderate to severe symptoms as outpatients. People got randomly assigned to a, a, a medication, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and they used clomipramine in this trial because at that time it was then and probably still now seen as the most effective treatment. Um, and the other, you know, I think uh, Prozac had come out by then, but all the other ones hadn't. So they chose clomipramine as sort of like the best medication to try, give it the best shot. Um, the exposure treatment that I just told you about, um, the treatment was delivered, um, it was a total of 17 sessions, but it was delivered five times a week for three weeks, then two home visits, and then 45 minute sessions out to 12 weeks so that you get an endpoint that matches the medication, the combination, or pill placebo. So let me, in the interest of time, jump to the results. So on the y-axis, I'm showing you OCD severity. Um, this scale goes from zero to 40. As, uh, symptoms of 16 or above is typically considered moderate OCD and warranting treatment. On the x-axis, I'm showing you weeks in treatment. So patients came into the trial with moderate to severe OCD. The patients who got a pill placebo, very little happened over 12 weeks, which is exactly what you would expect with a chronic disabling illness like OCD. It's not episodic typically, so this is what you would expect. Placebo should have little effect. Um, the red line, you're seeing the effect of clomipramine. That curve at this slow decrease uh, in the symptoms is almost identical to the FDA curve that got clomipramine approval for the treatment of OCD. Well, look at what happened with the cognitive behavioral therapy, whether it was, start it, whether, whether it was by itself or in combination with a clomipramine. Over that first four weeks where the treatment was delivered intensively, there was a dramatic decrease in symptoms, which was then maintained out to 12 weeks with those 45 minute uh, maintenance sessions. So the conclusion of this study was that all these active treatments were a lot better than placebo, 
but that this exposure therapy with or without the medication looked better than the medication alone. But there are two caveats. The therapy was delivered intensively by skilled therapists without significant depression. I guess that's three caveats, right? Skilled therapists, patients without significant depression, um, and intensively. And the caveat of the combination is, um, I, I neglected to tell you that the medications in OCD, they don't work immediately. You typically have to get to a good dose and it typically takes six, eight weeks to see the effect. So if you started clomipramine here, but you gave the, and the clomipramine takes that long to work up to 12 weeks, let's say, if you will, as the exposure therapy was done, before the medication really had a chance to kick in. So those two caveats. But these were exciting findings, right? Um, I had the good fortune of being a psychiatrist first on this trial as a postdoc uh, when I was mentored by Mike Leibowitz. And then when the therapist we had had to go on um, a, a leave for uh, a, a medical reason, I got drafted to be the therapist. So I got to be, I got to be, I got to see both curves, if you will, um, from a front row seat. But most patients back then don't get cognitive behavioral therapy. Like if you look at those data, you would say, well, gee, everyone should get cognitive behavioral therapy first. But most patients, they're, they're not enough availability of therapists. Um, and most patients back then didn't get it. And still today, most adults don't get um, CBT as a first line treatment. What's much more available to patients today is this medication. And yet, if you look at the end result of people who got a good trial of clomipramine, if you notice on average, their OCD severity is above the cutoff that would have gotten them into the trial to begin with. So that's the next question we asked. If this is what most people are getting and they still have symptoms that are less than if they weren't on the medication at all, but are still disabling them and getting in their way, what happens if you added the exposure therapy at this point? So that was the next study we did. So for OCD patients on serotonin reuptake inhibitors with ongoing symptoms, if you added exposure therapy, was it better than a psychosocial control? Um, and this was a very different design, right? So now we are bringing, we are recruiting patients already on a serotonin reuptake inhibitor and we allow them to be on anyone that was currently approved because we wanted to make this more real life. And now we're bringing them into the study and half of them got added on top exposure treatment and the other half got a stress management treatment, a sort of credible psychosocial control. And we're really looking for is the addition of exposure specifically helpful? Um, and let me show you those results. So this is the second trial, same thing on the y-axis as OCD severity, 16 and above being clinically significant OCD. On the x-axis is treatment week. Of note, in this trial, we did the therapy twice weekly. Both treatments were done twice weekly over eight weeks because that seemed to be more real world than the intensive treatment that we had done before. And everybody was on an SRI in this trial and stayed on it at the same dose when they had the therapy added on top. And what you can see is if you got the stress management treatment, you had a little decline, but really not very much. There's the response and remission rates of those patients. Whereas if you got that added exposure therapy added on top, much higher response rates, much better remission rates. So the conclusion from this study was that um, in fact, EXRP can augment SRI response when it's delivered sequentially like this. So the next question became, okay, as a psychiatrist, uh, uh, now I have an augmentation therapy, but in parallel in the field, what was happening were studies were coming out showing that you could also augment OCD patients on serotonin reuptake inhibitors with symptoms if you added an antipsychotic medication on top. And at the time that we did this study, the data were strongest for adding risperidone on top. So the third study we did, which was to now test for OCD patients on serotonin reuptake inhibitors with ongoing symptoms that were disabling them, what should a clinician do? Should you add exposure and ritual prevention or should you add risperidone? So 
This study had a similar design to the second study in the sense that we recruited patients already on serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We allowed any serotonin, up, any serotonin reuptake inhibitor as long as they'd been on it at an adequate duration and dose. But this time what we added on top was either that exposure and response prevention, prevention treatment twice weekly, just like in the prior study, or we added risperidone like had been done in, in um, uh, other clinical trials or pill placebo. So here are the results. So by now, probably you're getting used to these slides or the format. On um, the y-axis is OCD severity, 16 and above is moderate to severe OCD. Here are the eight treatment weeks that I told you about. Everyone on an SRI during this trial, SRI dose didn't change. What you see here is that if you've got that added exposure therapy on top, you see that line? It's almost identical to the line I showed you in the prior study. And that was like super cool. Like in clinical trials, you rarely get to replicate a clinical trial and you almost never get to replicate a psychotherapy trial. But to find really the same results across two completely different studies done more than five years apart with different therapists was really like really nice replication. The interesting findings here, look, and then there's yellow, which is placebo, which is what we expected. The interesting findings in this study to me were the, the risperidone results. I expected risperidone to end up where that star was. But in fact, in this study, even though we risperidone had a slightly higher response rate than placebo and a slightly higher response rate, uh, remission rate than placebo, um, it actually wasn't different than placebo. And I'm happy to talk more about that, why I think that is, why that could be in part the design of the study. It could be in part the design of prior studies. Um, but I, I guess the important message here is it doesn't mean antipsychotics don't work. Uh, when you look at recent meta-analyses, it's only anti the addition of antipsychotics, whether it's risperidone or aripiprazole or Haldol or other ones, they only work in about a third of patients. And that's what meta-analyses show. And so look at our sample size. We have 40 people in risperidone. And if, you, if, you, if it's only gonna work in about a third of people, then our response and remission rates are really not so far off, which you might expect. And then the sample isn't big enough to actually show a difference. So my message here is if you are a psychiatrist and you try adding an antipsychotic to augment your OCD patient's response, Remember that the effect is going to be acute. You're gonna see the effect in two to four weeks. And remember that only a third of your patients may respond to it. So if you see no response, take them off of it. Because if you don't take them off of it, I promise you, we see many patients like this. 10 years later, no one else will take them off of it because they think they, are, they have a psychotic disorder or they might unravel. So if you try that as an augmentation strategy, just make sure you really monitor whether it's working or not. And you shouldn't have to squint to see the effect. You should really see a big effect to keep someone on an antipsychotic as an augmentation treatment in OCD. Um, there we go. Now, I also wanted to make one other point. People often think, oh, I'll add the antipsychotic when the OCD patient's really severe. You know, if they're really severe, then they really need that antipsychotic. And I'm just showing you data from our study that just disproves that, which is what I'm showing you here is the baseline Y box and then the post-treatment Y box. And what I'm showing you, so lower is better here, right? What I'm showing you is this, if you got the exposure treatment, it didn't matter where you started or how severe you were, you could actually end up with really good outcome. And what we know from other studies that I don't have time to tell you about is what really makes the difference here is not how severe you are to start, but whether you adhere to the treatment. So this was really interesting, the risperidone response, right? Which is the people who had the worst outcome from adding risperidone were the people who had the highest symptoms at baseline. So where does that get us? So for the patients of today, where what I'm trying to do is improve current treatments. What I've showed you is that, you know, uh, a little data, and there's a huge literature on this that I haven't showed you, is that um, many will respond to serotonin reuptake inhibitors, but the response is usually partial, like I showed you in that first study. So if you're a psychiatrist, you're always thinking, what's gonna be your next step? Um, 
So what are we doing about that problem in my program? We're testing new medications. Um, and I could tell you more about that, but I don't have time because I want to talk to you about other stuff. Um, a bad exposure treatment, more will respond than to SRIs, but access and adherence to EXRP is really key. So things that we and others are doing there is testing technology to improve access, using cognitive neuroscience techniques to see if we can enhance learning, and also trying intensive formats to see whether those are ways um, to improve adherence and thus outcome. And finally, um, I didn't emphasize it, but I wanna emphasize it now, which is if you put those two treatments together, um, either as monotherapy or you put them together, we have first line treatments for OCD where up to about half of people will attain minimal symptoms. And that's, you know, like, yes, there's the half that won't, but that I wanna focus first on the good half right, which is, that's pretty impressive. If you think back to the 1980s where OCD was seen as an untreatable illness, we've got in our hands SRIs and this cognitive behavioral therapy that when you use them together and use them well, you can get people to minimal symptoms. And that's what leads to good functioning and high quality of life. Now, as soon as you get them well, I can tell you what our patients ask us, which is, hey doc, can I now go off my medication? And it's an interesting problem because um, psychologists have a tendency to sort of say, sure, go off your medication. And psychiatrists have a tendency to say, no, 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 don't go off your medication. But there hasn't really been good data to really inform us. So that's the study, the fourth study that Ed and I have um, recently finished. And it asked, uh, first of all, okay, after those acute, after that acute trial, will offering more sessions increase rates of remission? right? Because 17 sessions might not have been enough. But question two was, if you got well after an effective trial of exposure therapy, can you stop your SRI and keep your wellness? So we're going to be presenting these findings aren't published and they'll be presented for the first time at ABCT next week. So if you're going to ABCT and you'd like to hear about them, please join. But I wanna move in the second part of the talk to two challenges. I wanna move forward, which is the first challenge that I see is that I just told you we have these two treatments and they're good and they can get half of people well, but most don't receive them. And there are many reasons why people don't receive them. Their patients don't come for treatments, their clinicians miss the uh, don't diagnose OCD, or that clinicians don't know what evidence-based treatments are, or there's system issues where the system doesn't allow clinicians to tap into these treatments. Now, SRIs are now widely available and many providers use them and really know how to use them. That doesn't seem to be the problem. The real problem is with exposure and response prevention, arguably our most effective treatment, but this takes special training. So the question is, is um, can we do something about that? Can we? address the issue of access to this very effective treatment. So what I did here was partner with experts in my institute who really know about implementation and dissemination science, which is not my expertise. And we initiated a project um, that's a partnership with New York State and the Office of Mental Health. Um, and so my center is developing sort of is responsible for the content and the Center for Practice Innovation, their expertise is really developing online training and evaluating them and implementation science. And then we're working with the Office of Mental Health to disseminate all of these trainings all across New York State using the statewide online training platform. So our goals are to develop these trainings for frontline providers as well as an OCD toolkit to disseminate it using this platform. And we've also piloted an expert feedback on cases to clinicians in community settings. Um, this, the, the approach was really using these principles of implementation science where the process is to engage your stakeholders and find out what they want and need and then give them that, not what you think they want. And it's been really a fascinating process for me as an efficacy clinical trialist to work with these people and, and watch how they did it. So that was, you know, engaging stakeholders, conducting a needs assessment, learning what we learned about what uh, clinicians knew and didn't know and wanted to learn more about. Now we're in a process, uh, we did that. We then developed a training curriculum. We developed an advisory board 
the review of frontline clinicians, people with OCD, supervisors and directors of clinics across New York State. And we're about to launch these videos. We also develop methods for evaluating whether the videos really teach anybody anything or change practice. And we're hopefully going to disseminate these statewide in um, next month. So I find it really exciting um, to, to feel like this could actually make a difference in real people's lives. Like, you know, if I, if I sit at Columbia and I do these clinical trials, but no one can ever access the treatments that we've just tested, you know, what have you really done? But if you can really help move it out into the community, I feel like, you know, that, that's my mission. Um, and in parallel, um, I've also been working with, and, and that's a big collaboration with Dr. Sapana Patel. Let me just go back and point out her picture because she's essential to this. Uh, Dr. Sapana Patel is my real collaborator in this, as well as Lisa Dixon um, in the Center for Practice uh, uh, for Innovation and Melissa Hines. With Sapana, we've also been studying technology and can you use digital health technology to increase access to EXRP? Again, I'm happy to talk about it in the discussion period. I don't have time to tell you more about it today, but I'm very excited about whether technology can be used to either um, increase clinician um, ability to offer more treatment to people. Um, like that's how I see it, which is really decreasing clinician time in face-to-face -face sessions and using technology to really enhance um, how many we can deliver this treatment to. But I want to move to challenge two in my remaining time, um, which was I told you that ha you know we it's the good news is we have these two treatments and they can help half the people get really really well. And now the, that challenge one is how do we get it, them out to people? But challenge two is well, what about the other half, right? And some people try, you know, some people have had fabulous first line treatments and they've tried all sorts of medications and they've tried you know deep brain stimulant. You know, they've tried everything. And they're still really suffering. And for that, you know, from my point of view is my approach to that is, okay, let's go figure out what's causing obsessions and compulsions at the level of the brain. And can we actually then use that knowledge to develop novel targets and, and put new treatments to those targets that might actually help this part? So that's what I see as for the patients of tomorrow, because I don't see this as a um, quick fix. I see this as a long-term fix given the challenges in front of us. So if you think broadly, what do we know about what causes OCD? You know, there's, I, I think about this two ways. I think about, okay, there's pathophysiology, which is how does the brain produce obsessions and compulsions? And what I mean by that is, I'm talking to you today and it's my brain that's enabling me to talk to you. And it's my brain that's causing my hands to wave around. That's pathophysiology. And, and obviously our working model in psychiatry is that there's specific brain circuits that aren't functioning properly. And that's what's leading to obsessions and compulsions. And there are a range of hypothesized deficits and there's um, you know, data for different aspects of these in OCD patients. But that's a very different question, pathophysiology, than etiology, which is, if I have those abnormalities in the brain, how did I get them? And there, there's a different set of factors like genes, or there's studies of meta people with metabolic poisoning developing OCD afterwards. There are infectious agents that people with kids, sudden onset of OCD, people getting OCD after specific neurological insults, and even uh, environmental causes. So in my mind, I think of these as two separate processes. And most of the research has been on pathophysiology, although there's increasing studies of, of the genetic influences to OCD. So in terms of pathophysiology, you know, uh, part of why I got interested in OCD is early on, um, there were early studies, very exciting studies showing specific brain circuits being um, overactive in OCD that with effective treatment, normalize their activity. And um, those circuits include the orbital frontal cortex to the basal ganglia, particularly the striatum. And we know that that circuit loop is involved in many different brain functions, including the balance between goal and habit, including uh, reward processing. Um, so that's sort of like the, the simple model of it. But what's happened since then is many, many people, including myself, have done, oh, and I'm sorry, I should say, and 
the validation of that circuit, you know, people have done animal models and can show that disrupting this circuit in animals can lead to repetitive behaviors that can then be treated with SRIs, those repetitive behaviors. And some of that work, for example, was done here at Columbia by Susanna Mari uh, when she was uh, a postdoc. She's now at the University of Pittsburgh and doing really interesting animal work on that. But since then, lots of people, including myself, have then tried to say, okay, there's the beginning model. How do we fill in the details? What really is going on in those circuits? And what are the metabolic abnormalities, not just the sort of um, fMRI or PET activity levels, but actually metabolic targets that you might go after? So I got involved in using PET imaging to look at the serotonin system because serotonin reuptake inhibitors interact with the serotonin system. It's not that I thought that was gonna be the answer, but it was a place to start to sort of prove or disprove it. And we looked both at the serotonin transporter and the serotonin receptor. You could not have more negative data if you look at my um, histograms. I also used a magnetic resonance spectrum, and that was work done with Dr. Anissa Abidargam and Mark Larawell and, um, and other wonderful pet imagers. I'm not, that's not my expertise. I'm the clinical researcher who partners. I then partnered with uh, uh, Dr. Takoma Shangu and Larry Keglis doing magnetic resonance spectroscopy studies. And this was to look at um, glutamate and um, GABA in the brain of OCD patients compared to healthy controls. And there's a whole theory about that hyperactivity in the brain in that circuit that I showed you being due to glutamate abnormalities. But we didn't find glutamate abnormalities, at least in adults. In fact, what we found were GABA abnormalities um, in adults in the cortex and absolutely nothing in the caudate. Interesting because prior studies had suggested in pediatric populations there might be an abnormality. Whether that's a difference in methodology, whether that's a difference in age, I think it's an interesting question. And then, of course, the other big imaging modality is a task-based fMRI. And here I've partnered with Rachel Marsh, and we've looked at inhibitory control circuits. You could imagine, you could hypothesize abnormalities in inhibitory control systems that mean why OCD patients can't stop their compulsions. Um, and also there are data about um, reward processing abnormalities in OCD, and we found evidence for abnormalities in both. But it's actually all those details I don't wanna go into because what I wanna take you back is to the big picture. And this is sort of a summary of ours and many other people's neuro neuroimaging work over the last 10 years. And my point to you is that very simple model of that one circuit has now become this very complex model of multiple circuits that may lead to the complex profile that we see in OCD. Now, if you're a very skeptical clinician, you're probably wondering, how is all this brain imaging ever going to get us anywhere? And you're going to get pretty quickly to the following questions. Like, okay, well, wait a second. What's cause and effect? Maybe the abnormalities in the brain are because you have the symptoms, not that the abnormalities in the brain cause the symptoms. And brain imaging, like we're doing it, can't tell you the difference. And second of all, do we really think that all OCD patients, given the heterogeneity of their presentation, have the exact same brain dysfunction? And if not, which I, I don't think they all do, what abnormalities might be linked to which clinical profiles? But what's getting in the way of some of this work is really the recent challenge about neuroimaging findings in general, which is, are they robust and reproducible? And you need that to answer this question, and you need that to develop new targets. So that's the other initiative that I um, just wanted to tell you briefly about, and then I'll stop, which is this global initiative. This is a collaboration with four other expert OCD sites around the world. Um, it's Odile van der Hovel in the Netherlands, it's Jonathan Reddy in Bangalore, India, Dan Stein in Cape Town, South Africa, and Christine Lochner, and Yuri Miguel and uh, Rosalie Chavit in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and our site. And what we're doing is our aim is to identify signatures of OCD and then to try to link them to neurocognitive function and symptoms. There are the teams uh, all around the world. It was wonderfully fun to go visit before COVID. As you could imagine, this poor study in the time of COVID is really, has really been a challenge since Brazil and India and Cape Town and the Netherlands have all been badly hit the way New York has. The goal is to, is to recruit a very large sample 
across all our sites and to do exactly the same clinical neurocognitive and neuroimaging measures. It's also an incredible opportunity to explore the environment because we all come from such different cultures and we decided we would focus particularly on socioeconomic status, childhood trauma and different aspects of culture where there was some preliminary data to suggest these might impact brain behavior relationships. So in my last two minutes, right, I know we're almost done. Uh, I know it was sort of a big whirlwind, but I wanted to move you to the challenges and how I see that. So here's my take home. You know, I, I really believe that because of science, like what I've done, but like what many people have done in the last 20 years, we know so much more about OCD than we did when I first came into this field as a postdoc. We've identified first line treatments that can help about half of people become well. We have some pretty well-defined circuits that we understand their functioning. We just haven't yet linked them to the brain behavior relationships. We have several good animal models at this point. And then of course, we have unanswered questions. Why do we have treatments that work, but only for some? What causes an individual to develop OCD? That's what patients care about. They don't care about the group stuff. They care, why did I get it? Or a family member who cares, why did my child get it, right? And then how do the brain abnormalities link to the behaviors? And I think that's been a challenge across our field of psychiatry. And even with such a stereotypical disorder as OCD, and even with 20 years of knowing about this circuit, we're still struggling to sort of figure that out. Um, but of course, you know, what do I wish for as a physician scientist? That when a patient walks into my office, in addition to talking to them, that I could probe their brain function and use that to help tailor treatments specifically to them. And I really feel like to do that, what we need is really strong bridges between the basic and clinical scientists so that clinical questions inform biological studies and the biological discoveries make it to the clinic. And that means experts joining forces. And if you will, as a global study was designed with these goals in mind, partner with five of the other sites and to share our thinking and harmonize our expertise and procedures. But that's not enough, right? We need treatments that are not just effective for the brain. We need treatments that are acceptable and accessible to our patients. And we can have the best brain treatment in the world, but if our patients don't want it, what good are we gonna do? And um, I can tell you about data we have on how patients feel about deep brain stimulation. I don't think that's the answer for OCD. So the Impact OCD Project in New York State was initiated with this ultimate goal in mind, is how do we actually create a platform to ensure that the latest treatments get to patients across New York State? So um, with that, I just go back to this slide, which is, that's my biggest point, which is I believe we need all types of patient-oriented translational research to ensure that discovery science, that or that science leads not just to discovery, but also to treatment, better treatment outcomes for our patients. And I would argue that this is the real pleasure of being a clinician scientist. You might not get that cool discovery of the brain, but that ability to sort of bridge these worlds is what you can do. And um, I encourage MD and PhDs in the audience to consider joining our ranks because clinician scientists are a little bit of a dying breed and yet I think they're essential to our future. And I wanna end again by thanking obviously all the collaborators who I talked along the way and my research team at Columbia. With, this is an old picture, it makes me sad because there are all these other people, but because of COVID we're remote and I didn't, we didn't really wanna take a picture with all of us in masks. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much. That was amazing. I loved seeing the whole breadth and the new initiatives, the global initiative and the dissemination, which is obviously a really critical piece. Um, we do have a question from Dr. Gortzman. He says, in your first OCD treatment study, patients on drug improved to a Y box of 16 to 18, but in the subsequent studies that look like the baseline for the SSRIs was around 26. So is it possible that the patients in those other studies who are on SSRIs were non-responders right. and so therefore a, a skewed population? So, so I always love it when someone, so great question. So here's the thing, study one 
was um, people who'd never been treated, um, not, not never been treated, there were, there were people, but there were very few treatments back then. So it's a very clean OCD population, right? And, and they came in at about 25, 26. You're exactly right. The next two studies, when we went out to find people on SRIs, um, they didn't come in at 20. They also came in at 25 or 26 because they were ill enough that they wanted additional treatment. We don't have reports. Uh, we don't have them before the SRI and after. So I can't tell you definitively that they were non-responders, but we asked them all, what was there, uh, was there a response? And we also contacted their prescribing clinician. And what we wanted were people who actually had had some response, not who were non-responders. So, but you're right that they are, if you will, is study one, if you got, if you got better with an SRI alone and about 25% of people will, will achieve minimal symptoms, you're not gonna come into study two or study three. So the only people that study two or study three were going to recruit were the people whose symptoms were high enough that they still wanted to come in. I hope I'm being clear. So they are, study two, study three is a more treatment resistant population than study one. But given that it's a more treatment resistant population, the fact that you can get them much better too is actually, I think, the important point. Thank you. Uh, we have a second question. Dr. Heckers asks, what is the role of deep brain stimulation in the treatment of OCD? So OCD is one of the, um, yeah, I think it's the only psychiatric disorder at this point that has FDA approval under a humanitarian use device of deep brain stimulation. And it's used, it and um, surgery are still used in OCD for highly treatment resistant cases. And, um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting science and really important science to do, but just to give you a sense of it, I think it's Ben Greenberg has a paper and I may get the numbers slightly off. They were doing the randomized control trial of, of um, for uh, NIMH funded study. I think they evaluated, I, I'm, I, again, my numbers are a little bit off, but I think they evaluated like 300 people, you know, and it was something like, you know, 15 of them actually really needed deep brain stimulation. The vast majority of them had never had an SRI at a good and high enough dose, had never had a really good course of cognitive behavioral therapy, had never been in a residential treatment program. Um, so my message is, is I think there's a role for deep brain stimulation and certainly in terms of advancing the science of what, what these brain circuits do, I think it's very exciting. But do I think it's ever going to become a first line treatment like it has now become, let's say for Parkinson's disease? I, I wouldn't put my money on it is what I would say. And, I, and that's partly also because when you look at treatment preferences, OCD patients have very strong treatment preferences. And uh, we've done some work in that area. And um, OCD patients really view surgery as a very last resort. Now, if surgery was perfect, cured them and had no side effects, that might change overnight. But right now DBS uh, isn't perfect and does have side effects. Now, having said that, I have worked with Samir Sh uh, Chef when he was here at Columbia and uh, worked with my team and you know, I think it was about 10 people we evaluated and eight of them really didn't need DBS. They needed more intensive treatment or this or that. But, you know, there was a case of someone who had really done her homework, came for treatment, the, the DBS, uh, it actually wasn't DBS, that was surgery, was transformative for her and her life. So it's a long way of saying is, yes, it's an option, but it's after you pursue the other options at this point in time. I should actually mention, you know, the other thing that's sort of starting to create a lot of energy in OCD before you get to deep brain stimulation is transcranial magnetic stimulation. So just recently in the last year or so, the FDA approved a very particular type of deep TMS for the treatment of OCD. The findings were not dramatic and it was deep TMS paired with an exposure session during the TMS. So, you know, it's not like it was TMS on its own, but I would say watch that space because that's a non-invasive modulatory treatment, which if we can get it to work, patients like that. Patients actually really far prefer TMS to anything that's uh, surgery um, in their brain. 
Wonderful. Well, we're at time. Thank you again, Dr. Simpson. And um, I know you'll be meeting with different groups throughout the afternoon. So thank you again for that um, incredibly informative. And I would say call out to clinical researchers, um, potential researchers, really inspirational about all the spaces that um, are available for research. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your attention.